Perhaps you've heard of clickbait. Those headlines that you read that may not necessarily reflect the content you'll see if you click and take the bait. You know, like a photo of Prince Charles and what it says uh, on the caption is, what happens next will shock you, only to find that it's an article about staying away from power lines or something like that. Well, as we dive back into the book of Acts today, I could tell you that what will happen next will shock you, but instead I'll just tell you that the passage is about setting aside prejudice, and it's a hinge point in many respects for the entire life of the church. Peter obeyed the Lord, and what happened next may well shock you, so stay tuned. Welcome to worship. My name is Jeff Loach. I'm the pastor here at St. Paul's, and uh, we welcome all who gather here and online and encourage the folks online to hit the like and the subscribe and notification and all the things so we can keep in touch with each other. And the connection card is available for all of us at stpaulsnobleman.ca slash connect. Any first time guests among us today, either in person or online, there is a QR code on a card in the pew and you're invited to scan that and let us know how we can make a $5 donation to a charity of your choice, just uh, as our thanks for being here today. So uh, feel free to make use of that, all of our first-time guests. A few announcements. Easter Sunday at 9 a.m., there will be sticky buns and coffee in the gym, and you are encouraged to come and eat and drink them. Uh, so... Uh, Following that, there will be in here uh, an Easter hymn sing that is being organized by John Mullings, and everybody is welcome to come. Uh, then worship, of course, will happen at 10 o'clock. Uh, if you're able, by the way, we would appreciate contributions toward coffee hour supplies, and this includes uh, serviettes and stir sticks and juice boxes and Splenda and even compost bags. If you can offer any of these, please leave them in the kitchenette at the end of the hall near the cabin room. Our final announcement is a short video. Good morning. Got a quick announcement about our director of discipleship here at St. Paul's. Uh, we have hired, and you might know who we've hired. This is Allison Agnew. She was our last intern here at St. Paul's last year, and now she's practically the minister of St. Andrew's King. She is uh, going to work there half time and she is also still teaching at Kleinberg Christian Academy so she's going to ramp her way up toward working with us. Do you want to say anything? I'm so excited to be back with all of you at St. Paul's. I love being a disciple of Jesus and I want to disciple you and be discipled by you so we're going to have lots of opportunities to do that. Stay tuned. More information to come. So I'll put a little more information this week in between Sundays but uh, uh, the session knew from the very beginning that Allison was the natural choice, and we were delighted that she was willing to take it on among the other things that she does. So she starts April 1st. Patrick of Ireland was known to pray these words, Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me. Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I arise, Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. Let's worship God together. Please stand. <laughs> here to meet him as through word and song and prayer. We affirm God's promised presence where his people live and care. Praise the God who keeps his promise. Praise the Son who calls us friends. Praise the Spirit who among us to our hopes and Tell the tales that all may hear. 
hear the word of God this morning first from Mark chapter 7, verses 5 to 23. So the Pharisees and teachers of religious law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples follow our age-old tradition? They eat without first performing the hand-washing ceremony. Jesus replied, You hypocrites! Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. For you ignore God's law and substitute your own tradition. Then he said, you skillfully sidestep God's law in order to hold on to your tradition. For instance, Moses gave you this law from God. Honor your father and mother, and anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father or mother must be put to death. But you say it is all right for people to say to their parents, sorry, I can't help you, for I have vowed to give to God what I would have given to you. In this way, you let them disregard their needy parents. And so you cancel the word of God in order to hand down your own tradition. And this is only one example among many others. Then Jesus called to the crowd to come and hear. All of you listen, he said, and try to understand. It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You're defiled by what comes from your heart. Then Jesus went into a house to get away from the crowd, and his disciples asked him what he meant by the parable he had just used. Don't you understand either? he asked. Can't you see that the food you put into your body cannot defile you? Food doesn't go into your heart, but only passes through the stomach and then goes into the sewer. By saying this, he declared that every kind of food is acceptable in God's eyes. And then he added, It is what comes from inside that defiles you. For from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these vile things come from within. They are what defile you. If you are committed by faith to Jesus and have declared his lordship over your life, one of the ways that you respond to his grace in your life is through giving. Giving is not something we do out of guilt, but out of gratitude. We know this because the Apostle Paul reminds us in the New Testament that God loves a cheerful giver. Not a guilt-ridden giver, but a cheerful giver. Giving is a response to the work of God in our lives, and it has first call on our money. We know that because the Bible refers to our tithes and offerings as the first fruits of our labor. Uh, In biblical times, a shepherd would give the very best 10% of his sheep to the Lord's work, and that would be his first priority. Giving is what enables the local church to undertake its ministry, such as we are seeking to do here at St. Paul's, and we are grateful for your partnership in giving. You can make use of the envelopes that are in the pews or next to the offering plate that's in the lobby. Be sure to put your name on your envelope so we can give you a tax receipt for your gift. You can give by mail to 5750 King Road in Nobleton. You can also give by electronic means, the preferred method being electronic funds transfer, Uh, simply because there are no costs involved to any of us. Because of your generosity, we are changing hearts and lives, ministering to old and young alike with the eternity-changing good news of Jesus. Let's pray together. Life-changing God, we praise you for being the one in whom we live and move and have our being. We praise you for the promise of spring, for the new life it brings to the creation and the hope it brings to us. We confess that sometimes we take all this for granted. We see the seasons change and think of how much or how little snow we had to move and just carry on with life. Yet each day is a gift of your grace. We admit that we fail to marvel at the beauty of the creation around us, yet none of it would be possible apart from your delight with the world you have made. Forgive us our sins, gracious Father, and put a new and right spirit within each of us as we wipe the slate clean and start a new week filled with possibilities and opportunities to minister your love to others. 
thank you that your grace is enough for each of us. Thank you that we do not need to strive for our salvation, that you give it to us as a gift when we receive it by faith in Christ. We think of our friends in other religious traditions and those of no religious tradition who think they must fill their lives with ritual and good work in order to achieve salvation. Thank you that the good work was done for us on the cross at Calvary. Thank you that the good work was done for us when Jesus rose victoriously from the tomb. And thank you that he did this for all who will believe, Jew and Gentile alike. Thank you that your salvation is not limited by race or culture, but is offered freely to all who confess with their mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in their hearts that you raised them from the dead. We pray today for all who undertake your mission throughout the world. Especially we think of the Nguyen family as they minister to the people of Vietnam and particularly those whose mobility is limited. Bless them with safety and courage, and open the hearts of all who will receive their ministry of grace. We pray for Jeremy, Christine, and Nick as they mourn the death of Jeremy's mother. Give them comfort and peace. And we remember others in need of your healing touch, thinking especially of Terry and Audrey and Nancy and June and Gloria and others whom we name before you in the silence of our hearts. Almighty God, in your providence, you chose your servant Patrick to be the apostle to the Irish people, to bring those who were wandering in darkness and error to the true light and knowledge of you. Grant that we will follow in his footsteps as brave evangelists of the true faith, stepping out of our comfort zones to bring the gospel to those who need it, even those who are different than we are. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. None of us should be proud to admit it, but each of us, I'm sure, in some way, is prejudiced. Whether it's racial or sexual or vocational or anything else, we make presumptions about other people that may not be based in fact. The only people who might be able to stand behind their prejudices are statisticians because they have access to all kinds of factual information uh, about people in various areas of life. And in their cases, facts in hand, their, their prejudices would be right. But because they're facts, they would cease to be prejudices, just mere statements of fact, to which you might respond, thank you, Captain Obvious. Prejudice becomes particularly unhelpful when we use it to exercise ill will or hatred toward a group of people. For the Jewish people in Bible times as now, their main prejudice is against Gentiles, non-Jewish people. Why is that? Well, there's this book called the Talmud, and it's a series of commentaries on the law on the first five books of the Old Testament written by Jewish rabbis. And in the Talmud, they are... Uh, there are prescribed prayers for Jewish men to say upon rising each morning. And one of them says this, Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, who has not made me a Gentile. Why did or do the Jewish people feel this way about non-Jewish people? Well, it comes from their knowledge of being God's chosen people. If you're not in, you're out. A Jewish man thanks God that he wasn't made a Gentile because that means he's part of God's chosen people. Now, we've talked about before whether under the new covenant in Christ, the Jews are still to be considered the chosen people. But to save you referring back to my messages on Romans chapter 11, which are available on YouTube, by the way, uh, let me just say this. While there is some disagreement on the matter, I believe that the church, because of the saving work of Jesus Christ, 
supersedes the Jewish nation as God's chosen people today. In other words, for the Jewish people to be chosen today, they would need to profess faith in Christ. Does that mean I hate the Jewish people? Not at all. Like you, I have Jewish friends. They're kind, hardworking people. But anybody who doesn't profess faith in Christ is missing a key element in their lives, and I think the church needs to reach out to all people who are missing that key element, and that key element is Jesus. But in the early church, when most of the Christians were of Jewish origin, the big challenge they faced was reaching and ministering to people they had been taught to be grateful they were not. To the earliest Jewish Christians, Gentiles were unclean. You were supposed to stay away from them. But then Jesus had to mix things up a bit. When he commissioned his followers to carry on his work, you'll recall from Acts chapter 1, that he told them to go to, uh, to be witnesses in Jerusalem. All right. Judea? Okay. Samaria? Oh, a little rustling in the seats, <clears throat> clearing of the throat. And to the ends of the earth. Okay, that's going too far, they probably thought. And at that, Jesus ascended into heaven, and the disciples were left trying to figure out just what the ends of the earth were supposed to be. They had learned from infancy to be grateful they were not Gentiles, and yet at the same time, they were also present to see Jesus ministering to Gentiles. Those stories are all over the Gospels. When the Lord nudged these early followers, though, they responded. Philip brought the gospel to the Samaritans, of whom Jews were highly suspicious. He brought the good news to the Ethiopian minister of finance, definitely a Gentile and definitely from the ends of the earth. Saul of Tarsus, the zealous Pharisee, was converted on the road to Damascus with a specific commission to reach the Gentiles, a people with whom he formerly wanted nothing to do. Then a few weeks ago, we heard about Peter healing Aeneas and raising Tabitha from the dead. They were safe because they were of Jewish background. But did you notice how Acts chapter 9 came to a conclusion? I made a point to tell you about it. It's Acts 9 ends with verse 43, which says, And Peter stayed a long time in Joppa, living with Simon, a tanner of hides. I noted that this was a big deal because Simon, in handling dead animals for a living, would have been considered unclean. He was obviously a Jewish follower of the way, a new Christian, but Peter would have had to overcome his Jewish sensibilities to spend so much time in the home of someone whom his tradition considered unclean. But this was a harbinger, a, a sign of things to come. If Peter had been able to swallow his pride uh, or anything else, to be able to stay with Simon the Tanner instead of at the local Motel 6, he was going to have to do more than that to undertake what happens next. And what happens next may shock you. This is Acts chapter 10, verses 1 to 33. In Caesarea, that's Caesarea Maritima, by the way, not Caesarea Philippi, two different places. Caesarea Maritima was a Roman, a Roman city that was uh, set up kind of to showcase Roman culture. Mostly Gentiles lived there. The Jews didn't think much of the place. Anyway, in Caesarea, there lived a Roman army officer, centurion that is somebody in charge of a hundred men uh, by the way if you search the word centurion in a in a concordance or in your bible app almost every reference to a centurion in the new testament is positive the centurion seemed to have a soft spot for the gospel anyway in caesarea there lived a roman army officer uh, named cornelius who was a captain of the italian regiment he was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. Now, Cornelius was not a Jewish proselyte, but he was sympathetic to the cause and a pious, even religious man, which made him a good candidate to be somebody to follow Jesus. He gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. One afternoon about three o'clock, common Jewish prayer time, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming toward him. Cornelius, the angel said. Cornelius stared at him in terror. 
What is it, sir? He asked the angel. And the angel replied, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now send some men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying with Simon, a tanner who lives near the seashore. As soon as the angel was gone, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier, that is, somebody who would be sympathetic to the mission, one of his personal attendants. He told them what had happened and sent them off to Joppa. Now, what happens next may really shock you. The next day, as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. It was about noon, and he was hungry. Noon is not a common Jewish prayer time, uh, maybe because it was lunchtime. But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. That word trance in the original language of the New Testament is the word from which we get the term ecstasy or ecstatic. So he fell into a trance. He, he saw the sky open and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. In the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, and birds. These were symbols of uh, the entire animal world, clean and unclean by Jewish standards. And then a voice said to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat them. Remember, he was hungry. No, Lord, Peter declared. Now, we got to stop there for a second and understand and appreciate just how contradictory that sentence is. No, Lord. How do you say no and Lord in the same sentence? Of course, Peter had some experience with this, right? At the foot washing at the Last Supper, Peter says, No, Lord, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus says, unless I wash your feet, you will have no part in my kingdom. Then, of course, Peter says, well, don't stop with my feet, then wash the rest of me too. But saying no, Lord, just makes no sense. But maybe he thought this was some kind of a test. So he says, I've never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. So if it were a test, I suppose he passed. But the Lord has a different plan. Verse 15, the voice spoke again. Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. The same vision was repeated three times, and then the sheet was suddenly pulled up to heaven. Peter was very perplexed. What could the vision mean? Just then, the men sent by Cornelius found Simon's house. Standing outside the gate, they asked if a man named Simon Peter was staying there. Meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling over the vision puzzling, going over it in a thorough manner. It's not a common word. Uh, the Holy Spirit said to him, three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry, for I have sent them. So Peter went down and said, I'm the man you're looking for. Why have you come? They said, we were sent by Cornelius, a Roman officer. He is a devout and God-fearing man, well-respected by all the Jews. A holy angel instructed him to summon you to his house so that he can hear your message. So Peter invited the men to stay for the night. Interestingly, Jews found it easier for Gentiles to stay with them than for them to stay with Gentiles. But this would be a big step of hospitality that would prepare Peter for what happens next. And it may shock you. The next day he went with them, accompanied by some of the brothers from Joppa. They arrived in Caesarea the following day. Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered his home, Cornelius fell at his feet and worshipped him. Now, this was an act of humility for a centurion, but Peter was having none of it. Uh, Peter refused to treat the Gentile centurion like a dog, even as he refused to be treated like a god. But Peter pulled him up and said, stand up, I'm a human being just like you. So they talked together and went inside where many others were assembled. It's a good thing there were others assembled because Peter was going to need a boatload of witnesses to defend what he was about to do. It may shock you. Peter told them, you know it is against our laws, taboo, for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. So I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. Now tell me why you sent me, 
sent for me. Cornelius replied, four days ago, I was praying in my house about this same time, three o'clock in the afternoon. Suddenly, a man in dazzling clothes was standing in front of me. He told me, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your gifts to the poor have been noticed by God. Now send some messengers to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying in the home of Simon, a tanner who lives near the seashore. So I sent for you at once, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here waiting for God to hear the message the Lord has given to you. Talk about a receptive audience. That's the proverbial preaching to the choir he's got right here. Peter had the opportunity now to show Cornelius and those gathered in his living room what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. But that will have to wait till next week. So what can we learn from this interesting story? Well, first, as we've seen before, there's the importance of Christian hospitality shared with non-Christians. Those of you who have always been part of the church will not know how difficult it is, how much courage it takes for a person, especially in this day and age, to walk across the threshold of a church building. There's the sense of unfamiliarity, of course, that comes with walking into any setting that is unfamiliar. I mean, if you're a Christian, think about how daunting it would feel to go into the worship gathering of another religious tradition or even of another denominational tradition. I remember the first time I attended an Anglican church. I had no idea what to do, and I was afraid I was going to say the wrong part or kneel at the wrong time or be standing when everybody else was sitting. It was, it was concerning to me. It felt strange. But it was strange because I was the outsider. Or think of what it would be like to walk into a service club meeting for the first time. You don't know the people, or you don't know most of them anyway. Uh, You don't know their rituals, their traditions. It takes courage to walk in the door. And a person who has no church experience feels awkward walking into a Christian worship gathering. But, but that same person would probably have no difficulty walking into your house and sitting down at the kitchen table for a conversation. Why? Relationship. Homes are designed and decorated to be hospitable places. So when we offer hospitality in our homes to people we know, there's more likely to be a receptive open door to a faith conversation because of the atmosphere of hospitality. And as followers of Jesus, we can harness these opportunities as occasions for what we might call evangelistic hospitality. As I said last week, even, you know, the way you decorate your house can be a witness. Instead of live, laugh, love, which is about as deep as a thimble, uh, you know, you could put a Bible verse on your wall, you could put a cross on your door or a Bible on your coffee table, one that you've actually used, you know, not the one that's caked in... (laughs) five years of dust from lack of use. It's a witness for your guests, and it serves as a reminder for you. So don't hesitate to share hospitality with your non-Christian friends. The second thing I think this passage can teach us for application is that when we pray, God will speak. Most often it's through His Word. When we pray and read Scripture, God speaks through His Word. But sometimes God speaks beyond Scripture. You may wonder how you can tell if the voice is God's or yours or that of somebody you've been reading or listening to. But here's the kicker. You know it's not God speaking when it stands in contradiction to His Word. God will never contradict the Bible. If the message you receive, audibly or inaudibly, or it can be corroborated by a biblical principle, then you can be sure God is speaking to you. Peter went up on the roof of Simon's house to pray, and the Lord spoke to him. Initially, Peter thought it was contradictory to the word, but what it was was more contradictory to a tradition than anything else. The Lord pointed out to Peter that while he had been taught to stay away from Gentiles and other unclean things, God had made them good. All animals, even all people, were clean by virtue of being his creation. So God will speak when we pray, whether it's through his word, quietly or audibly. The big question is this, will we 
Listen. You may have a hard time seeing that cartoon. I, I use that one with my students from time to time. But we tend to fill our lives with noise. The shepherd is calling, and the sheep is saying, I wonder why I don't hear from the shepherd anymore when he's got his headphones blaring and he's got a magazine in his hand and his TV on and his radio and the Bible is at the bottom of his reading pile. You wonder why you don't hear from God? Usually it's because you're not listening. And what many people find very challenging in the midst of that is that to listen, we need to squelch out the noise. And people today are remarkably afraid of silence. Remarkably afraid of silence. Oftentimes we blare something in our ears to keep us from thinking about things about which we probably ought to be thinking. Too often, if we have any devotional routine at all, it's, you know, read a little bit of Bible, read a little devotional thought, say something to God, and get on with the day. Check, done. But that's not conversation with God. We need to linger in his presence. Read his word. Listen for his voice. It's not going to happen every time. But when we learn to separate ourselves from the noise that invariably clogs up our hearing, even clogs up our lives, God will speak. So engage in hospitality with non-Christians. Listen for God to speak when we pray. Third, and we see this writ large with Peter, We are called to live with the uncomfortable. This passage, by the way, is one of the key passages that gives me comfort when I eat bacon. Don't call something unclean that God says is clean. But Peter would have been reluctant prior, but with this vision... Peter was given the permission to eat anything, at least initially. I'm sure that made him uncomfortable. We don't know how old Peter was when this happened. I don't know, 40, maybe 50, something like that. But he was old enough to have his Jewish traditions deeply ingrained in his life. Avoiding hanging around with Gentiles was one of those traditions, and the Lord was calling him to abandon that tradition. I get it. Change is hard. The older I get, the more I understand that. It it makes me want to go back to former congregations and apologize. But as John Henry Cardinal Newman once said, to live is to change and to be perfect is to have changed often. And in this day and age, the pace of change is more rapid than ever before, and we're forced to change or, or hole up in the corner of the basement and wait for death to take us from this mortal coil. Change is inevitable, and God calls us to change some things. And I've said this before, and I'll say it a hundred times again before I die. The gospel never changes. How we communicate it must change. These churches that are dying nowadays, either they've changed nothing, or they've changed the wrong things. Either they're communicating unchanging truth in an irrelevant way, or they're changing the truth to suit society's warped standard. I read this interesting article this week or two ago in which, a, uh, in this sort of context, the phrase woke equals broke was said. Woke equals broke. But this isn't how it's supposed to work. We have to keep the unchanging truth of God's great love for us in Christ as communicated in his entire word from Genesis to Revelation. But we have to change how we communicate it if we're going to be successful. This was, uh, in the pandemic, uh, a real issue for me because the worship gathering before the pandemic was geared to all of us in the room, because what little we were doing with online was just the sermon, uh, so it was a little different. 
But when the pandemic hit, I realized there was no way we could maintain business as usual. Conducting a regular worship service to an empty room wasn't going to cut it with people watching on YouTube. So I had to think like someone who watches YouTube. That is a live picture of me thinking like someone who watches YouTube. And this is why I am not a graphic designer. But if, with YouTubers, if you, if you don't intrigue them in the first 60 seconds, you're probably going to lose them. So that's why each, gather, each worship gathering starts with this little hook. Just some simple, quick little thing that gives a, a short synopsis of the message so that people are encouraged to stick around. And even with you all here in the room, there are still people out there in internet land watching. Hi there. And some of them have never been to church before. Some of them are looking for hope. So we make changes in order that these people may be reached with the gospel because if we don't reach them, maybe nobody's going to reach them. You wouldn't go to a doctor who practiced medicine like he did in the 18th century, right? Methods have changed, medication has changed, many things have changed. Perhaps you have a microwave oven in your kitchen. Are you still cooking your roast wildebeest over an open fire at minus 30 degrees Celsius outside? Probably not. Change is inevitable. But it can be uncomfortable. We need to learn to live with the uncomfortable and sometimes to embrace it. And that's what Peter had to do when he walked into Cornelius' house. God prepared him for that when he stayed at the home of Simon the Tanner. And God prepares us when change is needed in our lives and comforts us in its midst. An example that some of you will understand. When your parents die, there is change. There is adjustment. When Diana and I were in Cuba in January, on our way back from town one day, uh, sitting on the upper level of the bus, up comes a cousin of mine that I haven't seen in years with her family. And we had a grand old chat. But when we got back to the resort, I found myself quite sad because I wanted to call my mom and tell her about it. And I can't because she's dead. That's a change. That's an uncomfortable adjustment. But it is inevitable. And the Lord brought me comfort in the midst of that. So offer hospitality to non-Christians. Listen for God to speak when you pray. Accept God's call to live with the uncomfortable. And finally, the passage teaches us this. There is no such thing as a hyphenated Christian. Peter had to learn that. And as we'll see next week, the concept of the Gentile Christian was going to be made very obvious to him. But Cornelius would not be a Gentile Christian. He would just be a Christian. There's no black Christians, white Christians, evangelical Christians, liberal Christians, neo-Orthodox Christians, etc., etc. There are just Christians. Now, there are people who name Jesus as Lord and people who don't name Jesus as Lord. And that's the line in the sand. You may be thinking... Too simplistic, Jeff. And of course, there are always nuances to belief. That's why we have denominations, different churches, different ways of being and doing church. But when you boil it down, either you love Jesus or you don't love Jesus, whether you're Jewish, Gentile, or any race or ethnic background or anything else. Oh, we have preferences. That's part of fallen human nature. We're not robots. We think differently, we feel differently, we prefer different ways of expressing our faith, and that's okay. But in our time, there's no reason for us to be divided, because we have a world around us that needs to see a unified church centered around the saving work of Jesus on the cross and in the empty tomb. Our identity does not depend on human distinctions. If we are prejudiced, we need to repent, whether it's a race or class or anything else. Our identity is in Christ alone. Yet, as one scholar has said, prejudice is often one of the last things that's touched by the process of sanctification. As we grow more like Jesus, sometimes that's one of the last things to change. God can change our hearts, but we're not sure if we will let him change how we feel about different people. 
God can change our ability to be generous, but we're reluctant to let him change how we respond to different ways of doing things. No, we need to let God change how we respond to others, even when we vehemently disagree and let it come down to whether or not the person truly loves Jesus. If a person loves Jesus, great. We've met another sister or brother in Christ. If the person doesn't truly love Jesus, then we've met someone to whom we may witness to the grace of God at work in our lives. Peter learned that Jewish distinctives were no longer significant if the church was going to follow Jesus' commission to witness to the uttermost uttermost parts of the earth. And that learning would lead to an encounter in a Roman centurion's living room that, yes, will shock you. But we have to save that for next week. Peter would see before him and learn the importance of something the Apostle Paul would later say to the churches of Galatia. That there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one In Christ Jesus, may we all be one in Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for showing your grace to your servant Peter, who overstepped his prejudices and went to Cornelius' house. Thank you that we too have the grace to overstep our prejudices, embracing whatever needs to be held in order to reach people who are far from you, no matter their age or race or class. Give us more grace, we pray, that like your servant Patrick, who went back to the land of the people who treated him so poorly to share the gospel, we will be able to welcome others in our midst at home or at work or in church so that they will experience the power of the good news of Jesus' love for them. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, because we know we cannot do this alone. We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If the Holy Spirit revealed prejudices to you today, he calls you to repent. If you'd like to talk about that, or how you deal with change... Use the connection card at stpaulsnobleton.ca slash connect, and I will be pleased to pray with you and encourage you as we seek to expand the kingdom of God in our time. Let's conclude our worship with singing. Please stand. In Christ there is
go into the world in peace, go into the world to serve, go into the world to be blind to prejudice, and to be open to doing all that God calls you to do with whomever God calls you to do it. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of us and those we love this day and always. Amen. Thank you.